Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. But I got a neighbor, and this neighbor works and comes in at 3.30 in the morning. Now, that's not a problem because I'm usually up at 4. But I don't want to get up at 3.30. 4 is plenty, you know. And this neighbor comes in, parks the car, no rock music playing, but they have a dog. This dog is one part pit bull, one part Rottweiler, and one part Sharpe. All right? It's, it's a strange dog. It's the nicest looking dog, but it's got a growl that just, oh, it scares me. And this neighbor comes in and, oh, and they name the dog Toast. Okay. Hey, Toast, come here. Blum, blum. Ah, 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 ah. Oh, Toast, you go to. Right underneath my window. And our houses are so close we can hear each other flush the toilet. It's that close. And I'm hearing that again. You have to love those irregular... So Carol brings them cookies, and we'll do each other's yard sometimes. We'll do all... Oh, how you doing, neighbor? We call each other neighbor like, you know, the guy in the television show, you know, all that. But this dog... I don't want to say gotta go, but could you just come home 30 minutes later when I... I just need 30 more minutes of sleep. Do you know people like that? How many know people like that? Okay. Maybe you don't have a dog, but you got someone like that. God calls us to love them. All right, let's go to number three. I hope you drew lines. I hope you drew lines in your Bible. I hope you took number verse nine. And as a father loves me, I love you. Then verse 12, and just as I love you, you're to love one another. I hope you drew drew lines there so you can see how that thing all works together, how much we really need to love each other. And by the way, the word love is found eight times in just a few verses. All right, let's look at number three. I need to sacrificially give. Now, if you're new to this, you're hearing sacrificially give, you're thinking, there it goes, or want my wallet. No, I'm not talking about just giving your, your money. I, I just stopped it with giving because I wanted us to know what we give is we sacrificially give ourselves. It's like we give whatever, whatever we have, we, we give it. It's just kind of like we give it. And so it may be money at times, and you might think, all oh, that church, all they want is my money. Yeah, but when you have a need, who do you go to? The church. You know, so they got to have it. But that's not where I'm going with this. I'm much, that, that's so minor. I think people can give money without giving themselves. But I don't think you can give yourself without giving money when it's needed properly. All right, let's go back to the passage because I want you to see that if there's a sacrificial giving thing going on in here. Verse 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. All right. Now, friends is an interesting word there because you could be a friend like a neighbor, an acquaintance. It's somebody that you're connected to, but the idea is laying down your life for them. Now, let me go up for a moment and talk about the tent deal, okay? Do you notice when you went camping with your kids that they didn't want to put up the tent because they wanted to go to the pool or they wanted to go hiking, they wanted to do whatever they wanted to do, go to the... The tent is something that dad does. Play is something that we do. You got that? You know what I'm trying to say? And so when that thing's going on, that means dad has to do everything and the kids are all having, and, and that, that doesn't work out. So let me explain to you what happens at camp. It happens every year. I told you how they, the first guy gets in, they set up the tent. Then that guy helps the next person set up the tent. Then you got three or four people with their tents. And then, and it happens every year. Families are coming in and they bought a tent at Walmart that they've never taken out of the box. Okay. And if you've been to camp, the wind is blowing a million miles an hour and <laughs> You're trying to read it. You drop it and you got to go a mile to pick up the directions. It's crazy. But everybody is working together. And I know that story, but let me tell you what's also happening. While you're putting up the tent, that also means you are not doing something else. And here's what it is. You're not playing. You're not out doing the things you want to do. You're not finding a tree and, and, and 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 a book to read. You are now helping someone else in a confused mess that's already tense, and you're tense, T-E-N-S-E, tense, getting this thing worked out. That's what sacrifice is all about. And let me tell you, putting up somebody else's tent and giving up maybe 30 minutes of your fun time, that's so nothing, isn't it? That is so diddly. That's so little when it's talking about giving up of your very life. Let me give you a real illustration that uh, might talk more about sacrifice and helping somebody up put up some little flimsy tent. I read in Leadership Magazine in 2003-2003 that a church in Naperville, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago near Wheaton, Illinois, near Wheaton College, Naperville, 
that this church got together and they heard about their like river of life like we have here that people didn't have a bunch of stuff. So the pastor did this on a Sunday morning. Now, this was cool. This is so cool. So get ready. I might do this too, but <clears throat> the Lord have to lead me. He had communion like we had on a Sunday morning like we have here. And at the end of communion, he said, there's a group of people downtown that just don't have shoes. And I just feel led to say that when you come up to get your communion cups, because that's how they did it. We pass it out. They came up. He said, when you come up and you pick up your cup and you pick up your cracker and all of that, he said, would you, if you feel led to do this and you want them to have shoes, would you take your shoes off and just leave them here? Isn't that a big deal? Okay. I wonder what time of year it was. The rest of the story might tell you. He went on in the article that said that they collected 1,600 pairs of shoes while the people walked to their car barefooted. Isn't that incredible? And he also said, on the same platform like we have up here, were piles of gloves, scarves, and coats that they took to those people. That's sacrifice. That's, I laid out my life. That's working together. One more story. San Antonio. Carol and I lived there for a while, and there are people in our church from San Antonio. It's a big church in San Antonio. I remember when it was small, like ours, and then grew. A church, not even of their denomination, and maybe if I dug deeper, probably is not even theologically right in all areas, but that doesn't matter. They still love God in some measure. It was an African-American church in East San Antonio, which is the, if I can properly use the term, the black area. And... um, That church, $3 million, a historic church in East San Antonio, burned to the ground. This church, the pastor said, you know what? We need to give that church money to help them get transitioned somehow. He called his elder board. Thank God he had good elders. And he said, I feel led that our church ought to give that church $100,000. And so he got the permission from the board. He went to his staff and said, this is what I think we ought to do. The board thinks it. I think it. Let's do it. So when the group met at that other church he then walked to the pastor before the pastor got up on his makeshift little stage in front of the burned out church building and handed him a cashier's check for a hundred thousand dollars no strings attached no connection no we're doing this so we can then build into your life here spend it however you'd like i checked that story out not only is it true i found out that the church was not torched although there are a lot of other facilities torched it was just the breaker box caught fire and it burned the church down. $3 million building. To me, that's sacrifice. There's no church that I know of that has enough money to just hand out $100,000, 10000 $1,000, or $10. We're all scraping for every penny that we have. But you know what that person realized? That church realized? In order for us, watch this, to together reach a community, we have to be strong. Watch this. It's not about that church having a building. Get, get what I'm saying. What, is, what it's saying is this. We as believers believe in each other and we got to be there for each other. You just happen to need a building, all right? But it's all about us. So the world sits back and says, look at what they can do. Together we can make a difference. And I already read this. It's all done joyfully. Now, would you think there's going to be some people in that church that kind of, I'm sure there were. There's probably some departments in that church in which they had more money for this, that, and the other. And they went, blah, blah. human nature. But I know overwhelmingly they did a great job. I got to get going. Let me finish up with a couple more points. Number four, I need to show loyalty. When I do this, I need to show loyalty. So let's take you to verse 14. It says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. I like that phrase. If you go back to verse 15 or down to verse 15, it says, but I have called you friends for all things I have heard from my father. I've made known to you. Shows loyalty. I want to talk about friends for a minute. And I want to... I don't want to pop anybody's bubble right here, but I would like to clarify some of your thinking so that you could have it more accurate. You know how in America today, there's this high relationship with the Lord. I love him and he loves me and all of this stuff. And for whatever reason, we, we take God and, and, and we want to be, we want God to be our friend. Now, I know what that really means. I know that it's meaning that if I could have any friend in the world, I would want God as my friend because I define friendship as someone who loves me the way I am. I define friendship as someone who will give his life for me no matter what. So I, I, I want God as my friend. But now let me clarify this. You, you can own that if you want to, but if you want to be more bl- biblical, then here's my question and you answer it for me. While all those concepts are nice, and I'm never going to take that away from you, 
Where in the Bible does it ever say that God wants us to be his buddy? You show me the verse, you show me the illustration. You will not find that anywhere in Scripture. And I did this big study on all the verses on friends, all the verses on friendship. I've taught seminars on this stuff, but I could never justify that God is my friend. Here's what I can justify, that God wants us as his friend. Not because he's lonely. The relationship is not that. The relationship is I look to God, not as my buddy. I look to God as my Lord, my Savior, my Master. I see myself as his child. I see myself as his slave. I see myself as totally surrendered to him that can do anything he wants with and through and to and for my life, even if I don't understand it and I cannot connect the dots. He has the right to do that. That's the relationship I have upward with him. Now, his relationship downward to me, Scripture does say, there's that friendship going downward. And here's what I mean by that. Abraham was called the friend of God. I'm going to get heavy for you in a second here, and I've got to close. I know I've got to get going. All right, but Abraham was called the friend of God. If you read through the Scriptures, you're going to find why he was called the friend of God. Not that God was his friend, but that he became a friend of God. Now, stay with me. This is key in the doing this together. You have God, you have man. God, man. Between God and man, that relationship is called an enemy. We are at enmity with God. There's an enemy relationship with God. So you cannot be on the same page. Oil and water cannot come together. There's a lot of theology on that. Jesus steps in. He then breaks down the wall of enmity by what he did for us on the cross. He forgives us of our sin. He then gives us his righteousness to go to heaven and we are no longer enemies of God and we become friends in that relationship. Are you with me so far? Okay, that enmity is now gone. Now, when I said that Abraham was called a friend of God, it says it this way. I'm quoting James 2, 23. It says this. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him or imputed to him for righteousness and he became the friend of God. Now, I said all that to say this. If you want that relationship where now you become a friend of God, here's what you need to do. Now, stay with me. This is key. It's, it's, it's lined up. You have to first believe God. Then you believe, watch this, then you believe in what he wants you to believe in. And once you do that, then you obey him. It's in that order. You cannot obey him until you believe in him or trust in him that this is right, this is true, this is what I should do, this is blah, blah, blah. And you can't do that until you believe him. That's why it says you have to believe God. Then you believe in him. So Abraham starts out by believing in him. Now something else is unique. In Jeremiah, and again in Second Chronicles 20, Abraham is referred to as the friend of God. I'm building my case of togetherness. I know this is a little heavy, but I want to give you more. He said, Jacob, which is kind of another term for Israel, was a servant of God. But Abraham was friend. And the reason being is where that Abraham, or excuse me, Jacob or Israel, did it out of obedience when they wanted to, didn't want to, they didn't. It was all outward relationship. It was more like master servant. When he looked at Abraham, Abraham looked at him, believed in him that he is God. He is the only God. He is my God trusted in him with that faith thing, now trusted in him in the fact that God, Lord Jehovah, coming to provide a sin bearer, trusting in him. And in so doing all of that, what did Abraham do? Whatever God told him to do, Abraham did. So he moved from just being a servant, he is now called a friend. That's why we're in this section of loyalty. Are we loyal to our person? Do we not just believe them, do we believe in them? Now that's the crux. Do we take it from believing to believing in them. Do you trust them? There's a book that was written by Dobson. It was called Love Must Be Tough. Did you? Ever, how many have ever heard of that book? Love Must Be Tough. Okay. I like the book in some areas and a lot of other parts of the area. I don't like the book. But the area that I really like was when he said this. When you say you have a communication breakdown in your family, communication breakdown in your marriage, communication breakdown in your team or church or whatever, it's because... You have lost respect for that person. So I ask the deeper question. Why would anyone want to lose respect for that person? It's when they've lost confidence in that person. 
So when you don't trust them, you don't respect them. If you don't respect them, you chip away and the relationship goes nowhere. So the real issue is something broke that trust that happened. And so how do you make things work together is when you have the trust. And that's why we go back to this loyalty thing here. That's why it says in the verse, you are my friends if you do what I command. In other words, do you trust me? Do you do what I say? Are we in this thing together? And here's my last point, and I've got to close with this. And that is, I need Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. Remember who gave his life for us? It was the Lord. So now I need to trust in him as my personal Savior. So I I, I said all of that, not as a tag on at the end of a sermon, got to give the gospel. It's like it's full circle. Can you look up here? Can you see this? I have a circle drawn over here. You have the Godhead working together. It comes all the way down. I now have to trust in the Godhead. I, know, I must now believe that Jesus is God. I must believe now that God gave his son on the cross, made the complete payment for my sin. I must be completely confident in the fact that going to heaven is not by works, but by faith alone. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to trust that Jesus is the Lord. And now I'm going to trust in Jesus as my savior. And once I do that, watch this, watch this. Once I trust in him as my savior, the Holy Spirit comes inside of me, which now gives me the power to obey him as my Lord. So I must believe he is the Lord. I can even believe that he is my Lord, but going to heaven is by faith in the son, the resurrected son of God. And now I surrender to him as my Lord, not to get saved, not to stay saved, but because I am saved. Now watch, once I do that, that Godhead, that's my model of working together, lives inside of me, which now makes it easier for me to love all of you who are now having the Godhead inside of you and operating the same way. Now, some of you are going to say, does that get me off the hook if I don't trust Christ and if I don't, um, do I have to love everybody, even the people that are not right? Do I have to really love everybody? You know what the answer is? Yep. If, if someone is um, not in harmony with you, that could mean that they're your enemy. What does scripture say to do with our enemies? Love them, bless them, and do good for them and pray for them. So if I love them, what am I going to do? Pray for them. What else am I going to do? I'm going to do good for them. What else am I going to do? I'm going to bless them. So do you have someone, watch this, watch this, that you're not in harmony with? Maybe they're acting a little bit like an enemy would. Not that they would hate you and try to cut your tires or something, but it's more like they don't want to be around you. They diss you. They marginalize you. They ignore you. They even talk behind your back. They plot some things against you or some things for themselves. Whatever they're doing, they're they're dissing you and your reputation. You have that as an enemy would do, although they're your brother or sister in Christ. It doesn't matter. What does the Bible say to do in that situation? You might not be able to walk together in unity because they are on the opposite side of that, but that doesn't mean that even though you don't walk together in unity, that you then abandon them. What you do then is you love them by praying for them, by doing good to them, by speaking positively. That's the word bless in there, bless them. It's opposite of blaspheme, which means evilly speak. So this would be positively speak. You do that even when you aren't together. Why? The root is because by doing all of that, the togetherness we're in is we're together with the Lord. Who knows? You might bring them into your little sphere of influence in. Who knows? It might, they might get into your unity room with you. I don't know. But that's the door that you make it work. So now let's bow our heads and close our eyes and give you a moment to go through uh, your contact manager in your mind. Would you do that? Would you go through that contact manager, your little iBook? in your mind? Would you go through a directory you have in the drawer by your telephone? Would you look at your, your smartphone and in your mind and look at all the people you have in there in your address book? And is there anyone in there that you're just not together with? What do you think you might need to do? Maybe your first step in loving them is to forgive them. Maybe your first step in loving them is to pray for them. Maybe your first step is to start doing something that costs you something that would add value to them, something that they need, not a, a cheap little bone you throw at them, but something of significance. Maybe it is stop feeding yourself with negative thoughts by talking negatively about them to others. That's how you get together. Maybe for some of you, it's to really own the concept that the Godhead is together. He lives inside of you. And together with him, you can make a joyful difference. So 
Your issue is to get on the page with Him. Maybe some of you is to follow the Lord as your model. Uh, Yeah, the Lord loved, God loved the Son, but He loved you. And He says, just as I loved you. That's a sermon in itself. Just as. So then spend time talking with your family. How did? How much did? When did? Why did Jesus love me? And once you've answered all those questions, now you've got to look to the others and say, just as the Lord did that to me, I need to do that to them. But God gives you some hope. He says, but you don't love them with your love. You love them. And then you say, but I can't, but he can, therefore I will. And you let him love them through you. So you become an instrument of his love. Maybe for some of you, it's to give a little bit more. There's more sacrifice than you need to do. You have surfacy relationships where you're kind, you're courteous, but they cost you nothing. Someone bought me an iPad this uh, month or so ago. I didn't ask for it. Didn't know it was coming. They just bought it. I wanted to get a cover for it because I didn't want to scratch it and I want to be able to cover it and use it. I didn't know which one to get and they're all over the map for prices. My wife was sharing this with some lady. She took her iPad out of her cover and handed it to Carol to give to me. That's not a surfacy relationship. That was a sacrifice. I'll never forget that lady. I'll never forget she and her husband. He bought it. It cost him something. I now have it. And it has nothing to do with an iPad cover. It has everything to do with someone who sacrificed something they had to give me something that I didn't have, that I needed, and plus enjoyed. Maybe that's where you need to go to that person. Is there someone in your family? Someone in your neighborhood? Someone on your job? Someone in your classroom? Is there some loyalty that you need to show? What is real friends all about? And then finally, you can only do it when you've trusted Christ as your personal Savior. It begins with Christ. So is there anyone in here that's willing to maybe say to the Lord, Lord, I know I've done things wrong. I know I cannot get to heaven by my good deeds, but I'm going to place my faith alone in you right now. I need you to help me get it together with myself, with you, and now with others. Lord, I'm trusting in you for the full forgiveness of my sin. And Jesus says, he that believes on me has right now everlasting life. So on the authority of a risen Savior, if you trust in him alone, not by works, not by faith and works, just by Christ, you'll forgive him. Would there be anyone in here today that's ready to say, Pastor, I'm trusting Christ as my Savior. Now, I'm not going to have you come forward. I'm not going to have you stand up. I'm not going to mention your name or describe you in any way. I am going to pray for you, but when I do, it's, it's mostly just so you... So you and others know I'm praying for someone in here, but I don't want you to be embarrassed. But I'd like to know if you're trusting Christ today. If you're saying, yes, pastor, today is the day that Christ now is my savior and I'm gonna get it together. Would you slip up your hand? Put it up, put it down. Don't say a word, just put it up, put it down. I'm gonna just say, God bless you. Put it up right now if you're trusting Christ. Never done it before, you're doing it now. Okay, Christians, how many of you are sensing the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about getting it together? with the Lord and then joyfully making a difference with someone else. That you're you're going to make this something real special because you want to make a difference in your family, in your neighborhood, on your team, on your job. You're not going to compromise. You're not going to roll over and play dead and put a sign on your back that says kick me. But you are going to go out there and do what you can to be together to make a difference. But you'd like to have prayer because you too know it's hard and you'd like me to pray for you. Do you slip up your hand? Is there anyone at all? God bless you. Many hands. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have taught us these great truths. You've modeled these great truths. And whatever you've implored us to do through command and precept, you give us the power to do. And then, Father, your power is always greater than the commandment. And so, Lord, thank you for that. And now, Father, let us yield to that so that, Father, we truly can be together to make a difference joyfully with others. In your precious name we pray.
Amen. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear. Make it clear.